Hey, how about that? Another Thursday night. Hey, everyone. DK here with Adventures in Dirt coming to you live on another Relics Radio Thursday night. Boy, I tell you what. Hey, Tony, uh, Thursday night, what do you think? Thursday night, it's another episode of Relics Radio. Yeah, uh, been a, it's been a week. It's been a week and a half. We missed last yeah, week. Yeah, we missed last week. Um, we had to... Uh, turn that down and uh you know come back this week with another great guest so uh who we got coming in the chat i see the chat already feel well it, it's worth the wait for this week for sure i'm excited for this right. week but we've got uh ohio relic hunter beating everybody into the chat first tonight saying evening uh mr bill hayes saying hi all lewis bean we ken and i always talk about lewis bean and we bring it up to a lot of different people how we do one time lewis was in the chat in vancouver island british columbia canada on a ferry listening to relics radio talk about an international show right how cool is right. that didn't he didn't he call in did he call in yeah he called in on I the think ferry he called in from the ferry boat right <laughs> how cool is that yeah uh yeah. xx marks the spot mr right. mr mark uh finding america yeah hello all hello greg Hey, Greg. Yep. Metal Sharks. Metal Sharks coming in. Boy. Nice. Getting a lot of people already. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, welcome, everyone. And a real quick shout out to Mr. Bill Hayes. Did you happen to see what he found? Yes, I did. Oh, my goodness. Congratulations, Bill. Pulled himself a nice 1849 large scent. Beautiful. At a site that he has just pounded and pounded and pounded. And he gives all the credit to that day as too. I was going to say, he found it with the D word. He did. He found it with the D too, man. Good for him. Uh, Look, it looked great. Amazing. looked in great condition. Condition. It's a beautiful coin. Great, yeah. great coin to find. I'd love to find one of those. Yeah, there are air around here, man. Colorado. <laughs> We're not finding too many largies. No. Uh, it's pretty rare when you yeah. come up with them. Ken, what have you been up to lately? I have been... Well, you've been, out, you've been, been out digging. I've been, yeah, you know what? You've been out digging. I, you've been out digging. <laughs> I I've went been out, out digging. You went out digging. <laughs> no, you went out digging. <laughs> we uh, did. Gosh, we got we, out. We finally got out, man. We, Two and, weekends ago. You know what? Though we kind of pushed the envelope. We probably <laughs> didn't really need to get out because uh, what did we find? Oh, I don't even know if you can call it digging because <laughs> there was very little Jack. digging going on. Yeah, when you got a set, when you got a target, it was more like uh, jackhammering. Oh, the, it was so difficult. It was crazy, absolutely crazy. And, it was uh, exhausting, is what it was. I mean, it I was, and both both of us were using brand new machines, brand new machines, and, and frozen ground, <laughs> incredible uh, shovels too. Not not. Uh, flimsy little ones but it, it was exhausting every time that we actually decided to, to dig a specific target it was a minimum 10 15 minutes just to try and find out where this target was i was trying to explain it to people and people are like yeah okay we've heard that before stuff but it, you had this one video you put out already where it shows you with your yeah. shovel <laughs> and you're using it as a hand digger basically you're you're chopping Chipping it away the ground, and it's just like chipping a quarter inch at a time as you're it, shoving your shot you're gigantic you have that huge grave digger man and yeah. that is probably the most beast of a shovel you can get out there as far as you know just heft yeah. and and weight and it's a monster and it, it was exhausting it, it was it was crazy but we got but it was a new property it was a new property for us so you know yeah. how excited we were and we were both swinging <laughs> new detectors and first time out and well, and it, it had has, the weather. Yeah, it hasn't gotten better in the last two weeks. We've had two snowfalls since then. Went last Wednesday and yesterday. And so yeah. I don't know when the heck we're going to get. Well, actually, I do know the next time that we're going to get out. <laughs> Probably, <right? laughs> we need to get at least one time before then. My gosh. I sure hope and I so. I think we do have some 50 degree weather coming up. Yeah. Sad, but it still looks overnight that it's still low. But uh, yeah. What'd you find? What Did I you find, find anything? I, found... I, mean, I know we couldn't dig stuff up, but yeah. we still pulled a number I... of targets out of the ground. Yeah, there was. Uh, I, I kind of gravitated towards an area of a large tree near near the house. Uh, I don't Smart. want to give away too much information on on uh, what type of location it was, but um, you know, swinging the manacore, have no clue. You know, it's a mine lab. I've never swung a mine lab before. Uh, I've swung Garrett's for many many years, and so this is my first time out. 
um, and was able to uh, actually find a 1930s Colorado tax token, which was Ooh. the square one, which I didn't have. I, I actually looked at my uh, collection. I have two of the round ones, but I did not have any square ones. So I was happy to find a square one, but uh, that's really about all I found. We yeah. like, we didn't dig many targets. It, it, well, we couldn't is the problem. Yeah, we just couldn't. I mean, so I wanted to dig everything because I, I was know. swinging that new machine and I wanted to see, you know, you're learning it. So you usually dig everything and see what's telling you. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was, man, it was so difficult, but I, I would, I, it wore me out. It, it, every target, you had to be so selective because mm -hmm. you knew you were going to kill yourself digging a target out. So you had to be extra sure. And I'll tell I, you what, I, I dug eight cans. <laughs> and what and, and a tax too. token so yeah. that kind of explains which what uh what you're doing out there is just trying to you figure got it that out. other that uh you got that gun and, badge too, uh, yeah a little like... little marksman air rifle i'm pretty sure it's an air rifle little badge thought it was pretty cool i you know again i i don't know how old it is but uh you know tax tokens from the 30s i i was in that same area with the marks the marksman thing i, I don't think it's the 30s but uh definitely an area where kids were Definitely area where kids work is right on the other side of that tree. I picked up the um, the yeah, the little uh, toy cap gun. Yeah, uh, I got the name of it too somewhere, but uh, yeah, I broke it to pieces <laughs> trying to get it out. The well, way. it just was ridiculous. I broke it in like five different pieces. Yeah, your plug just trying to get ridiculous. out there. I tell you, I'm extremely disappointed in your plug. I tell you what, <laughs> Shoot. you need to go back to metal detecting school. I do. Oh, gosh, <laughs> that thing looked ridiculous. But uh, it was fun. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I did have one find that um, made my heart stop a little bit. You did. Yeah. You absolutely did. You guys were all hanging out, and I came walking up to you guys like, hey, uh, was the 101st Battalion coming this way? <laughs> it's so funny. I, uh, I pulled back the dirt, and all I saw was like a glint of brass, and it was an oval end yeah. sticking up. Out oval brass oval brass it was gorgeous yeah dead on plate and <laughs> I, my heart skipped a beat and i looked and i was alone like there was nowhere near me we were in a vast area so people were pretty spread out and um i was like oh my gosh what is this <laughs> <laughs> do i stream I, now or do i do i dig a little further there it is yeah yeah so i'm showing it to my uh, camera i know you guys can't see it but it turned out to be a, an old 1950s uh cow tag <laughs> uh cow 101 cow tag, uh number 101 so cow 101 big uh big thick brass tag with a hole in it um and i looked them up and they used those around in the 50s so pretty old i mean yeah. not you know they're not new and uh, cause now they use the plastic ones and stuff, but it shocked me, man. I was like, oh, no. We're on a good but spot, though. It has some history. Uh, we're talking, you know, at least another, from that cow tag back, at least another 70 years. So, well, more yeah. than that, maybe 80 years. So we're, we're going to get on it. We'll probably be out there all, all year. Um, so yeah. uh, those of you listening, that if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channels, we're going to have quite a few videos, I'm sure of this location so yep it should be fun what else you've been doing uh, the weather has just been crazy i think it's yeah. two degrees right now yeah yeah it was negative eight open. negative eight when i got out there this morning so yeah that was about it how about uh, cool. some announcements yeah what do we got going on we've got real quick announcements and now i want to get to our guest because yeah. uh yeah. well i'm we looking got a lot to, to talk about brandon um yeah, what do you got pulled up there? Oh, hey, look, that's right. Yeah. And that, you know what? I just got the message today. This is now official, 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 official. You are you are uh, bringing it to the public now. Public announcement. That's right. We uh, we'd kind of announced it last uh, show, and uh, it was kind of not final, final, but we, it is now final. Two th uh, in 2023, July 7th through the 9th. Rush to the Rockies 2023, the Stampede, right here in beautiful Conifer, Colorado. Two days, five hunts, plus a kid's hunt. I tell you what, $290 until May 12th. And uh, then after that, the price raises to $350. It's a seated hunt. There's also going to be an early bird registration before April 1st. They go into special prize drawing. And they, last, year, last year, the prize was pretty amazing. Mm. Um 
and uh yeah we've we've got a um a lot of sponsorship happening and you know like most events these days uh the manufacturers really are going to step up and just a lot of local um you know people supporting us with prizes and giveaways and stuff and uh every bit of the money you spend to come to the event goes straight into the ground we have our our special master silver buyers and uh coin connoisseurs out there and different uh, artifacts that um all get put into the ground and uh it's a lot of fun man last year was amazing um you get you did a really good video on that uh mm -hmm. kind of showing the event yeah i'll have to find that real quick here yeah yeah, you should throw that up. It's uh, right. pretty amazing. So Rush to the Rockies 2023, the Stampede, July 7th through the 9th, uh, right after 4th of July. Come on out here in Colorado and visit with us. We're up about 8,000 feet above sea level, <laughs> and we're climbing on mountains, climbing on hills, and doing some detecting. Uh, two days, five hunts, and a kid's hunt. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, get a hold of me if you have any questions on that. But you can also go to eurekathc.org. Uh, Eureka Treasure Hunters Club here in Denver, Colorado, and we will have stuff promoted on that Facebook page, and we'll put it in the links down below too. We're excited to bring it to you again. I tell you what, last year was so much fun. We yeah, didn't know if we'd do it again this year, but we decided we were going to do it. We've got the committee put together because uh, it's a lot of work, man. Putting on a hunt is a lot of work. I'll tell you that. But everyone had a blast last year. We had about 100 people out there last year. Everyone had a blast, and it's good. Uh, I'm looking forward to the stampede this year. It should be pretty darn fun. Yeah, everyone's invited except yep. for Mitch King out of Florida. Yeah, that guy. He's he he's come. no good. He's <laughs> he gonna pop up, up in the man. chat right now. That's happened he last time we talked too. about it. <laughs> Mitch, we're just kidding, man. Bring, bring, your, bring your own detectors this time and come on out. That's It'll right. Be great. Yeah. Hey, let's bring our guest on, Tony. Let's get to Brandon. I'm excited to talk to him. Yeah, this when I started uh, watching YouTube for uh, treasure hunting, metal detecting, those types of videos, this was one of the first channels that uh, I started following. And I, I tell you what, man, if you guys aren't following Adventure Archaeology, you guys are missing out. Uh, incredible, incredible channel and an even more incredible man. We've got Brandon Nicholas with us tonight. Brandon, what's up, brother? How's it going? Hey, Brandon. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me on tonight. I really appreciate y'all thinking about me. Yeah, absolutely, thanks man. I'm glad you could. Uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Boy, what have you been up to besides, <laughs> you know, getting wet and getting dirty? I tell you what, if you're not familiar with Brandon's channel, you got to check it out. Brandon, tell us what you do, man. Tell, tell, those, tell the people listening, uh, you know, the listeners of Relics Radio, what you get up to. So I'm known as the bottle guy. And uh, I, I do a little bit of everything, but antique bottles is definitely my forte. Uh, at the end of the day, if I'm out in a 15-foot deep hole, uh, that's where I like to be. <laughs> and, and you're not kidding. 15-foot yeah. hole, you're, you're not that's exaggerating That's generous. That's, uh, yeah. You're... I've seen pictures of you guys down in your pit, and mm. it just makes the hair in the back of my neck mm. stand up. Because all I'm thinking is cave-in, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, my gosh, look at these guys. But you find the goods, man. That's where the stuff's at. Yeah, we, we really do. We have a good time doing it. But, you know, we have a lot of people, you know, that are really concerned with our safety because of the way things look. Uh, however, you know, obviously with YouTube and, you know, a, a camera, when you film something, it always looks a little bit worse than what it is. Uh, but thankfully, my dad has been doing this since the 1980s, so I am a second-generation bottle digger slash metal detectorist, and uh, it has helped me stay safe. So thankfully, we've never had any collapses or anything like that. I guess anything's possible, but we do take a lot of preventative measures on the safety realm to keep our guys safe when we're down in these deep holes. Yeah, that's awesome. You said your your father was into it. I was going to ask you how you got into this. Like, was yeah, it uh, that's cool. metal detecting first and then graduating into bottle digging or the vice versa? Well, it was vice versa. Actually, my dad was a deer hunter back in the 60s and 70s. And in the late 70s, he was walking through a pine thicket here in Alabama. And uh, as he was walking through the pine thicket, a piece of pine straw rubbed across the bottle and it made a really squeaky sound. He reached down and picked up a couple of 1890s whiskey bottles and brought them home, not really thinking much about them. A uh, neighbor came by and take a look, took a look at what he had found, and he was like, hey, I want to buy these from you. And he's like, wait a second, these are worth money? I just thought they were cool. <laughs> and uh, he, 
he ended up selling them to him, and that ended up lighting a fire underneath him for bottles uh, that carried him into the 80s. Him and my mom were married in 1981, and by 1983, he was swinging a Garrett metal detector, so he was doing a little <laughs> bit of both. And after that point, uh, he did not pass on his knowledge to me, sadly. As a kid, I remember metal detecting a little bit, but he kind of got out of it. But mm. by the time I was 20, which is about 15 years ago now, so, sadly, <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, You're... he uh he passed on the knowledge to me at the age of 20 about bottle digging because he said he was concerned for my safety and took me to one of the largest bottle dumps here in the Birmingham, Alabama area. And my very first bottle was a Hutchinson style bottle, which is exactly what we go after every week now. And that just, man, I, I'm telling you, the bug bit me and that was all it took. <laughs> Those are the big wow. dog, right? Those Hutch bottles are big, big dogs, right? Some of them can be, you know, it really, with bottles, things always kind of vary, but the thing that I always tell everybody is they look at it, they see the shape of the bottle, and they immediately say, I have one. But that's not always the case. The town on the bottle is what dictates the value, usually. And just like anything with collectibles, I always, you know, people are like, oh, it's an old bottle. What's it worth? Nobody collects that kind of stuff. And I always go back to, well, what about the guys that collect stamps or Pokemon cards for the younger generation or baseball cards for the older generation? <laughs> you know, it's a piece of paper. Why is it worth several thousand dollars? Well, there's collectors, and they, you know, it always depends upon the supply and demand. But with bottles, the smaller the town, usually the more valuable. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> I, you know, I've recently started selling stuff on eBay, and boy, I tell you what. Uh, learning all about collectibles is a whole nother world and, uh, glass is just one of them. You know what I mean? Yep. But it, it can be anything from, you know, images on a piece of paper to, uh, you know, thumbtack of different <laughs> styles and varieties. Like it's just crazy. If, if there's, if you can find something in your drawer, somebody's collecting it guaranteed, <laughs> guaranteed, uh, man. Well, I so, uh, I gotta I gotta say, uh, you know, when, when we started off and, and I introduced Brandon, I said I've been watching your channel for so long. There, it was a couple of years ago, and you were doing a giveaway, and you know, I made a comment on your video just because I I enjoyed watching your video so much. I ended up winning. Do you remember this, Brandon? I ended up winning one of your bottles. I have it right here with me, and oh, this yeah, is look at that. This is one of my favorite bottles. I mean, I've got a, a, a display case. This is the first bottle I put in there just because. Um, it's such a beautiful and incredible bottle. It is from Alabama Bottling Company in Birmingham, Alabama. And it has a, looks like an eagle, I think, on the front of it. And it's one of those Hutchins bottles. Yep, that's, I, I do exactly remember that. And you're uh, right, that's been almost four, almost four years ago now. Can you believe that? <laughs> I, I can, but I, you know what? I it, it, You kind of got me so interested in it. Um, and this bottle, it means so much to me. Um, because I know that I'm never going to dig one here, and it's something that I can have in an area that I'm, you know, never going to be able to probably find a bottle like that. And and uh, I, I just I enjoyed your 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 channel so much, and I really love that bottle. I I do appreciate that, obviously. It's a beauty. It's so cool. It's such hey, a cool looking bottle. I'm very very privileged to say that a lot of these Alabama bottles that we find, uh, they have traveled all over the world. Whenever we have sold some of them. I know in the relic world that selling things that you find are really, you know, it's one of the things that people really frown on. But with antique bottles, it's not like coins or relics. You got to think, uh, you know, if you mm -hmm. got a hundred coins, you can fit them all in one case. If you have a hundred <laughs> bottles, where are you going to put them? <laughs> and if you That's and true. if you've got a seven year old daughter like I do that loves to throw a ball in the house, you know, how long are they going to survive? <laughs> oh, yeah. I know one place you don't put them in my basement because man, my wife is already starting to think I'm turning into a hoarder and she doesn't want any more collections down down there. I'll tell you what. So you can't put them in my basement. <laughs> no, you're, you're uh, right. So, so for, for, for me personally, I, I hold on to usually one of everything, but the thing is, is when you get into a town, you end up finding duplicates. So as I find duplicates, I figure it's not going to do me any good to have five of the same bottle sitting on the shelf. I'd rather somebody else, uh and enjoy it you know enjoy the history and thankfully we've got viewers all over the world now we're close to 750,000 followers which is insane on multiple platforms now and uh we've you know it's a lot of people and it blows my mind every week to see people commenting from australia uk uh even the west coast still blows my mind that there's people in california watching us uh, it's just one of those things that really takes me back. I'm very, very fortunate to have the viewers and the followers that we do, and I could not be more appreciative for all of those people that tune in, tune in every single week to watch this, whether we find something or whether we don't. 
We usually the, film it because I hate to give a false pretense on, you know, we don't always find stuff. So I, I'll film the days that aren't good, too. <laughs> right. Let that sink in. 750,000, Tony. It's amazing. That's almost a million, man. You're going to hit a million. Hey, when you hit a million, we got to do something special. Let's, let's say. Hey, uh, I'm game. How, how, how about what Tony said? He said he'll never find one of those. Y'all buy a plane ticket, come down here and come dig with me. I'll put you in a 15 foot hole. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yep. Uh, either, that's what we got to do. We got to do an RP. Because I tell you what, you are our 100% inspiration. Mm-hmm. Um, I never even thought about digging bottles until I started watching your thing, your show, and your content, and all your stuff, and then started chatting with you. Mm-hmm. We be kind of became friends, and uh, Tony uh, got really into it. And he, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard our bottle digging story. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I don't. But I, I don't think I've heard it. I, I think our listeners have heard it a couple times, but I love telling it because it's so funny. Uh, but and 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 you know, it's directly tied to you because you are our inspiration for it. But um, yeah, we did some bottle. Go ahead, Tony. We did some bottle. Yeah. Digging. So <laughs> I I was looking at some old maps, found uh, an area that uh, an old old homestead probably was on. So went out there, and I'm poking around in this field, looking looking, you know, see if I can see any any remnants of anything going on and. Uh, this truck pulls up and gets out and starts yelling at me, Hey, what are you doing? What do you know? I said, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just looking for an old home site. I do model, uh, metal detecting as a hobby. And, and all of a sudden his whole demeanor just changed. And he goes, you, you want to see where some old stuff are? Come back over here. My, my family owns all this land here and we're building a brand new development. We're, we're putting in custom homes, but this was all homesteaded by my family way back in the day. So come on back up here. I'll show you, uh, you know, where the old homestead was. I'll show you. There's even an old bottle dump. And I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? So he took me back there. He shows me this flat area where the house allegedly was. We didn't find anything that showed us that there was a house there. But he took me over to where the trash pit was or the trash site, you know, where they threw all the old stuff. And you can see stuff. I mean, I, I know that you walk around in the in the uh, the woods and you you see these bottle dumps and things like that. You know, on the ground. And uh, sure enough, you know, you can kind of see where the, the trash was at and everything. And and uh, he says, you know, go ahead and you know start digging and stuff. So I call Ken right away. I'm like, Ken, man, I just got permission to go <laughs> bottle digging out here in Colorado. We've never found a bottle dump before, right? So I'm poking around. I'm like, Woo! On, <laughs> on my way. <laughs> yeah. So we come out like the first weekend. Um, and was it the first or second? I think it was the. I can't remember if it was the first or second. Anyways, we've got this big tarp up over That's the bottle. The second, weekend. second weekend. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, I brought out like a, a canopy. We've got music going on. And we're underneath this canopy and we're digging. And you know, we weren't finding super old. Uh, you know, things like you were finding. We're finding things from the 30s, which old is old to us here in Colorado, especially if you've never been bottle digging before. And uh, this guy comes driving over with his uh, his truck, and uh, he brings over a six pack of beer. He's like, hey, you know, you guys, you you look thirsty. You want some beer? We're just having a guy, grand man. old time, right? And, and he's the owner, so we're like, Whoa, yeah, this yeah, is awesome. yeah. He's, he's offering the, to bring a backhoe over for us, and yeah, he and says, I can, the dirt. <laughs> I can dig this out. I'll go bring my backhoe. I'll be right back. And he drives over. He drives his truck over, gets his backhoe, starts coming. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. What what's going on here? So we end up finding some uh, prohibition whiskey bottles, which again they're over in my display case here. Another part of my favorite uh, bottles that I have, and uh, you know we end up finishing for for the day and and uh we go out there i think the next weekend we're doing the same thing we're digging we're getting further into it and all of a sudden we see this truck up on the uh up on the horizon up on the top of this hill on the peak and we're like that's kind of strange because there's no road right there and uh we're like you know thinking nothing of it he ends up driving down and it's it's a new person we've never met before i actually have my gun on me um you know i'm and my ho- i'm holstered and everything but uh you know we're on the we're on the middle of, of eastern colorado this guy gets out and he goes what are you guys doing we said oh we're we're digging in this trash pit and uh we've got permission from so and so he's the owner he said this his family settled over here and everything and he goes that guy's not the owner. I'm the owner of this land. What are you talking about? <laughs> and we're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. he, I think the guy didn't just tell us one time that he was the owner. Like, oh, it was multiple weekends. You know, he kept bringing his dog out to see us, bringing his beer, the backhoe. Like he would, yeah, he was, it was his land, no doubt about it. And then this other guy shows up. Yeah. It says, uh, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and we just, we, we talked, oh my gosh, you know. 
we didn't we didn't know that he goes yeah you guys can dig out here the only thing i ask is you don't bring your firearms out here and everything we ended up never going back out there i think we were a little you know i think he was just being cordial and stuff but uh, i i definitely didn't feel like he was really allowing us back onto the property but uh yeah. we pulled some fun things out i mean it was it was a great time and and uh i tell you it's always in the back of my mind how in the world can I find some old bottle sites or some old dumps? Because it's a whole different adventure than metal detecting. And, and it's just, you know, if you love history at all, you know, all of these different ways to, to, to uh, treasure hunt, you know, always sparks your interest. And bottle digging is one of them for me. So I'm like, what's going on? We're not finding a hutch or anything. Brand yeah, new. I know. It's so easy. <laughs> yeah. These are, I mean, they're the thousand dollar bottles out here. There's got to be. Hey, Colorado does have hutches, just so you know. Oh, man. You know, I'd so move to this new town up north. Of, yeah, I, you know, I'm trying. Uh, that's one of our questions we have for you. We're going to talk about research and such. But um, I moved into a new town. It's kind of an earlier town here in Colorado, and I've uh, been really digging into the history of the town. I joined the board for the uh, local museum, and, um, you know, I'm just learning, learning, learning a lot. And there used to be a glass production company here early 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 uh in colorado's history even before it was a state i think there was a glass company here and uh there's it's right here in my town and i'm trying to find a location because they had to put seconds and stuff you know probably down by the river somewhere i'm thinking um and i'm just trying to find out you know as much as i can where the dumps may have been in those early days and you know, would have they have thrown out seconds or where would they have put that mm -hmm. stuff? And, uh, you know, I'm just I'm yeah, salivating I'll, over the opportunity. Oh, but. yeah. Yeah, and I would tell you, being in Colorado, I've only been through Colorado for a few days in my entire life, which, which has been a few years back now. I got in a creek in Telluride, Colorado, thinking I was going to find glass. And there was no glass in the creek, which is the complete opposite of the South. In the South, if you get in a creek, you're going to find glass every, like, Two inches. I mean, it's just glass <laughs> everywhere. I got up in the creek in Telluride, and I'm walking down the creek, and I'm only finding bones. And I'm sitting there going, what am I doing wrong? You know, what's going on? Telluride's been there for a long time. Yeah, How's it right. nothing here? Yeah. And so I, I, I got to doing a little bit of research on Colorado. If it were me and I was going to start in Colorado, I would avoid probably the towns, and I would probably go after where the gold miners were. The gold miners had to have had whiskey. They had to have had camps. And they would have not had easy access to a place that would have had like a, uh, a trash service. So they would have been dumping their stuff someplace. And, you know, the mm -hmm. more gold miners that were there, probably the bigger the dump. And with that being said, you know, if they were digging gold, they were drinking, they were definitely drinking whiskey. They were spending <laughs> it. Yep. That's yeah. right. So we I do. Would, I yeah, would we definitely, definitely start do. that. Yeah. We love digging those old silver camps and those gold camps for sure. Yeah. Um, the, the main problem we have with that is it's hard to find Still. exactly where the dump is, but you do find, usually what you find is you find a huge collection of uh, tin, large of collection tin. of tin, a lot of tin, all their tin cans, all their pork and beans, all that stuff, <laughs> uh, just tons of it littering the ground. And sometimes in large concentrations, and it makes me think, is this actually the dump or is just, and so what's deeper than this? Um, and how deep do I have to go? to start hitting glass, I mean, I'm not seeing any glass, just tin, mm -hmm. just tin and iron and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. And, you know, did they, were the bottles closer to the river uh, and, or did they put them in a separate area than all this tin or did, am I just not going down deep enough now? I know about probing now where I didn't know about probing then. And so that's what, what, what probably what we need to do, like go, go back up there to Caribou or something, Tony, and, mm -hmm. and or one of those old towns like that and, do some probing to see if we can hear any glass as we uh, push down past all that tin. But yep. Well, and I mean, even with a even with a Hutchinson style bottle, I mean, they had a tin stopper that was inside of it. It rings up in the 60s and 70s on a Garrett AT Max. So just keep in mind, if you're going to find a Hutch bottle, they will ring up. Obviously, you got to be in the metal detecting range, so you know, six or eight inches deep, you may be able to find it, uh, depending on where they were at. Uh, up where you are. I can't say that I'm an expert up there because, like I said, I've never done bottles up there. But I would have to think that everybody was on the same page of if we're going to throw this trash away, let's not throw it in an area that we're going to possibly use 
for many, many years. So they're going to look for an area that's either a large crevice, you know, a crack, a ditch, you know, a large valley that's not usable, a swamp, you know, something like that. That's going to be where they put their trash at. They're not going to put it in an area that they may think would be developed. And, you know, usually we're looking for the 150-year-old bracket. That's the stuff that we're trying to find. And if you're doing that, then you got to think that the, there weren't very many cities back then. So if you're on the outskirts of a town that they thought was going to blossom and bloom and be a big town, then you may be in a good spot if you get into one of those areas like I was just talking about. If not, then you could be in a spot that they may have thought, well, that might be our public library. That might be a school one day. That might be a park. And so you got to always kind of think about that. And one of the things I figured out is usually these dumps are still owned by the city. The city never relinquished the property. They never let it go to anybody else, another owner, and they keep they keep it. And hmm. now it's not a dump, but a lot of times now, at least down here, it's a park. Yeah, the uh, this new property we're on that we were just talking about uh, at the beginning of the show uh, used to be a little town, and um, <clears throat> there was a stage station there and uh, a ferry real close, too, a ferry. And... Um, the person that owns the land knows the history of it and said that there is a dump. There is a bottle dump somewhere on the property, somewhere near down by the river, but um, she didn't know exactly where it was. So that is still on our to-do list once the ground softens a bit because it was, it was covered in snow when we were out there. Um, and once the snow melts is to get out there and try to see if we could also – we want to find the ferry. We want to find you know, yep. the crossing. We want to find the dump, and then, of course, you know some of the other buildings and stuff. That's our that's our goal. But if we get into a dump site, forget we're about have it. To, uh... Now we were in a depression. We were in a depression that uh, there was mm -hmm. there was a lot of tin on the ground and yep. a lot of scrap, <clears throat> and uh, you know it was it was near the river. And I because of the depression, I thought I wonder if this is the dump. You know. <laughs> well, it's very possible. I mean, and something that Tony said earlier about the 1930s bottles that y'all are digging not being as old, I will tell y'all this. Uh, I know y'all not being bottle guys specifically. <laughs> uh, don't let the age don't let the age dictate what you think about a bottle with the collectability side. Uh, we've had several bottles just in the last two months from the state of Alabama that are from the 1940s and 50s bring four and five hundred dollars a piece. So age does not dictate value or the collectible side. So the 1930s stuff, 1920s, 1930s are referred to as the deco style. That deco style bottle was not collected by many bottle diggers. And I've actually had some of the older bottle diggers here in Alabama tell me, we used to throw those back. Well, <laughs> when they would throw them back and they would cover them up, well, guess what? That means that there weren't that many brought to the market. You know, the fewer that are on the market, the more valuable that they are. So <laughs> That means that the deco style stuff is actually more sought after now than what it was, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. So wow. the deco stuff, don't don't sleep on it. That's good stuff. Yeah. That's promising. Yeah. Right, Tony? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and yeah. I do like it just because it was, it literally is from the prohibition area. And it, it does say, you know, not for, you know, for federal use and, and all that kind of stuff, not to be reused and, you know, again, just the kind of the history side of it. I mean, that, that was a huge part of the history of the United States. And, uh, you know, I, to have an amber one and a clear one, uh, I, I I, think they're just really cool bottles. I love whiskey, so, you know. Yeah. Do you all know whenever Prohibition was set up in Colorado? I know here in Alabama it was in 1919. Yeah, don't know exactly. No. No. Okay. Because I was curious <clears throat> if it was much different. I know down here in the south, you know, they refer to it as the Bible Belt. You know, everybody was really hardcore mm. on being against liquor and whiskey and all that kind of stuff. So by 1919, the alcohol stuff just disappeared. So if we find a embossed whiskey flask with a local town name or a jug, we already know that it's going to be over 100 years old. And usually that stuff's way more collectible because it wasn't made for an extended period of time, especially if it says saloon on it. And I have to imagine Colorado Ooh. should be loaded with saloons. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. They like to drink here. There wasn't much else to do. <laughs> so, uh, Google, Google says 1916 to 1933. Yep, just pulled that up. Okay. 16, yeah. So, yeah, y'all actually went into it a little bit earlier than we did, which is hmm. kind of shocking to me. I would think being out yeah. in the Wild West that it would have been a little bit later. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was ruthless. Uh, the Wild West and alcohol didn't mix so well because there already was not that much to do and things were scarce. I mean, 
you know, people were desperate, desperate, desperate. I mean, there's even stories, that, uh, terrible stories of, you know, these wagon trains that would get attacked that would later it would be associated and and sort of uh, pinned on Native Americans attacking it was actually very desperate pioneers that were in, you know, desperate straits. And the uh, tra- you know, wagon trains and, and carriages that were coming in had goods and, and, and food and supplies on them. And uh, it was real easy to kind of pin some of that stuff on the Native Americans. So there are stories out there of that stuff happening. Um, so, you know, the them trying to say, look, we, things are getting really out of hand and we're going to try to curb the violence and the drunkenness and the crime by, uh, you know, doing prohibition. I could I could see it. I could see it. There's a lot of stuff. I, I read a lot of old newspapers because they're yep, filled that's... with amazing information. Yes. Right? Yeah. Oh man, the the newspapers dot com. If you don't have a subscri- subscription to that, and you're a relic or a bottle hunter, I mean, you're really missing out. There's so yep. much useful information on there. I know it's like nine bucks a month or whatever it is. I forget. I just let it come out of my account at this point because <laughs> it is that useful. I mean, there's so many articles. Yeah, they're not going to exactly put you where a dump site is or a really good spot to metal detect. But a lot of times there will be some very useful clues in there. We have some articles talking about where somebody sadly was murdered and dismembered and they found a, you know, a piece of somebody here in the local dump. Well, <laughs> that put us right within two blocks of where we needed to be to find one of the sites that we were at. Uh, the other things are there were a lot of people that were complaining to the city council about either uh, rodents like rats and stuff like that because of the dump or the stench, <laughs> the smell of it. So with the complaints that we go to the city council and once it hit city council, obviously it was going to land in the newspaper. And then it would be like, uh, you know, Miss Betsy at, you know, 22nd Avenue was complaining about the stench from the dump. <laughs> well, it doesn't, nec- you know, it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly where it is, but you know, she's close enough to smell it. Yep. And if you're that close, then you know, you're in the right area. <laughs> there you go, man. Yeah. There you go. And we're in, we're, we're graced here in Colorado because they have something called the Colorado Historic Newspapers Collection, and it's free. And they have uh, basically OCR'd all all the newspapers from, from 1859 forward to, uh, I don't even know how high they go. I think they go all the way up until current times. And everything is searchable. So all the words are searchable. So you just type in a phrase. You know, it does the Boolean search and all that stuff, and you can do an exact phrase or any of your words or all of your words, and it just brings up articles and advertisements. So, like, when I'm trying to find out where the circus was held, because I want to know where the people were at or where the, you know, anything was, or where the swimming holes were, try to do that, you know. Um, you can just you can just type that in, and, and you're inundated with articles to read through. And it highlights the words that you were searching for, too, so it points it out on the page. It's really, really great that Colorado has that. But newspapers.com, man, that, that thing's awesome, too. I use a lot for uh, genealogy research. Absolutely. No doubt on that one. So I heard you all talking earlier. You said it was negative 5 degrees there this morning? <laughs> negative, negative 8, yeah. Yeah, it's it was cold. cold. See, I, I can't relate to that. Today it was 85 degrees here. In <laughs> gosh, man. Gosh, man. Thanks. We, we Thank you, man. We yeah, I appreciate that. We literally just throw the waiters off and say, we're just going to get in the creek today without the waiters. <laughs> Jeez. All right. We're not waiting until a million subscribers to go, no. to go out and see Brandon. We're going to wait until he's at 751,000. <laughs> and then, and then well, we're, we're out already, there. Well, we're already there, so come on. No excuse. All right. So <laughs> that's fine with me. 85 <laughs> degrees. Sounds great. Because we're leaving Colorado and we're heading to England in two weeks, and uh, we're heading well, right into cold, wet weather, too, over there in England, so, too. So y'all tell me, please tell me you have scheduled a day to be on the River Thames. Oh, yeah. well. Sore, sore subject. <laughs> oh, come on. So, ahead, so the intent, yes. The intent is yes. there, absolutely. Uh, that was one of the first things we talked about because we actually we're going in uh, two days early to yeah. do things. Yeah, and, like mudlark. Like yeah, like you know, <laughs> dig around in the mud. And yeah. uh, we read an article. It's what stopped in November. They st- well, you had to get a uh, a permit for it, 
So, you know, oh. go online looking for permits. Well, yeah. the demand has grown so much, it's gone from about 500 permits per year that they are granting to over 5,000 per year. And so what they decided back e effective in November was they're putting a, a, a you know, a, a, a nix on the entire mudlarking uh, uh, permit process they're, they're not given anymore why, so why, why they do a study to find out what possible detriment to wow. the ecosystem and everything else granting 5,000 permits a year would do you know uh, well i was gonna say the the amount of trash removed i would think that they would be grateful for that <laughs> you, you, you would, would think, think right yeah yeah we're cleaning up all those damn uh clay pipes all the clay pipes out there <laughs> all the clay pipes and all that stuff right get all that clay out of the water but uh yeah, we. Uh, I was like, oh man, uh, I think it was. Uh, I think it was Matt Howell actually that uh, when I told him I was going and we were going to go mudlark, he's like, oh, you still can you sure you can still get a permit? And I'm like, well, sure. I just talked with Ill Digger who was there, you know, in the summer, <laughs> and you got one, and you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So no, sore subject, man. We're like not very bummed nice. that we can't do that, you know. Yeah. And Honestly, I'm sure Nic Nicola all... White. I'm sure Nicola White still can go, and I'm sure there's certain special permits that they're right. letting go. So we're trying to get a hold of her, yeah. sweet talk, <laughs> hey, Nicola. Yeah. I've, is, talked, uh... I've talked to uh, Nicola and Cy Fines a couple times. They've sent me a couple bottles that they found that they needed some ID help on. Oh, cool. And uh, they both seem like great people. Uh, I don't know if their permits can carry a guest, but that would definitely be <laughs> what I would try to lean on. <laughs> yeah, they right. they probably right. know people. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's yeah. who they'd hung up. Didn't uh, Deej and them hook up with Sci Fines back mm -hmm. then, uh, when they mm -hmm. went? Yeah. yeah, I think they hooked yeah. up with them. So. Maybe we'll reach out. Maybe we'll reach out and just go, hey, what are the chances? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it would be worth it. Even if you didn't pick anything up, you let them pick it up. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. We could just yeah. document it. We'll go down where right. we got we got cameras and, you know, yeah. Yeah, Cy Fines, man, he'll he'll be on a, uh, a hovercraft sometimes. I'm like, man, what in the world is going on over in England? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he's a cool cat, man. I like that. I like it. I like uh, what he's doing over there. But it's 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 fun, man. It's another. It's just another more treasure. It's another angle, right? It's another yeah. bit of treasure hunting history. History. Oh my gosh, you pick some up. You don't know what it is. It's got a name on it or something. Like I love that stuff. Like I'll go research it. And be like, do you know what this is? You know, like this stupid cow tag. You know why I know it's from 1950? <laughs> <laughs> because I researched this thing like crazy. I even have this iron link. I found this yeah. gigantic yeah, iron to link. To a chain, yeah. Uh, like to a chain, you know, like on a bike chain. You got yeah. the, the double hold link that holds the links together. Well, this thing's probably about three and a half inches long. And it's about, you know, almost a half inch thick. And it's got some kind of name on it. And I tried searching that name to see if I could figure out what it goes to. And it's just no, there's just no. Nothing, huh? Finding it, no. <laughs> Couldn't find a single thing on it. But I love doing that. I love doing the research. Do you ever come across a bottle you can't identify, Brandon? Has that ever happened? Or, no. Man, you've been doing it so long either. now. All the time. That's the thing that a lot of people get confused because I find bottles down here. They think I'm an automatic bottle expert, and sadly, I am not, and I try to let people know that. I love to find bottles. If you want to call me an expert, say I'm an expert at finding bottles. Don't say I'm a bottle expert <laughs> because there are, th there are thousands and thousands of variants in usually every single state. Uh, and with that being said, there's nobody that's going to be able to be an expert on all of that. And with me having a large following, I get messages every single day to the point where I had to set up an automated message system <laughs> that pops up whenever people ask about, hey, how much is my bottle worth or how rare is it? And it pops up. It pops up that says, I'm not a bottle expert. <laughs> I, just, I, I absolutely love finding them, but at the end of the day, I cannot, I could not identify. If you call me tomorrow, Ken, and say, I found a Colorado Hutch, how much is it worth? I tell you, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, I'm you keep to... learning, you keep learning, like, you know, like, I, I even right. listening to you, even listening to you tonight, yep. Brandon, because you've said that forever, you've been saying that for a long time, you're, you're no, you just, you, you're an expert in digging, you love to dig, but you're no expert in bottles, but you keep learning, man, you know a lot more now than you did, you know, a few years ago, that's for darn sure. Yeah, and I mean, in all honesty, the digging has taken a backseat to me with American mud larking, so, I mean, I was probably one of the first few channels to to go out and get in creeks and rivers and try to search for bottles here in america 
Uh, people have been doing it for years and years here. I wasn't the first one to do it, obviously, but I was probably one of the first ones to film it. And by filming it, I realized that there were way more people interested in me being in the water than they were me digging giant holes. And I was <laughs> like, wait, well, I couldn't figure out why. And then it hit me. I was like, well, not everybody wants to go dig a 15 foot hole on Saturday. <laughs> they can throw on a pair of waders and get in the creek, though. <laughs> right. Right. And yeah, you, that's, you that's walk true. those There's... creeks, man. You you walk the same creeks. You go up different uh, tributaries, right? You different different branches of it after uh, you know rains or or whatever. And you're and you're bringing up different bottles every time that you go up there. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that I've had to deal with uh, with having a large following like I have. Uh, it, it's one of the things. Imagine metal detecting, and every single item you picked up had the name of the town that you're in. Right. And Very tough. So with me, that's. That's been one of the things that I have battled. Uh, it's a it's a double edged sword. I love informing people. I love bringing new people to the hobby, and I love seeing the younger generation get into it. But at the end of the day, every single time I pick up a bottle and I say, "Hey, this is from Birmingham, Alabama," and uh, they see that I'm in the water, and then almost immediately people can go, "Oh, well, there's only three rivers or three creeks in Birmingham. He's in one of them." And then <laughs> the competition is just unreal currently where I am. So I've started traveling a good bit and uh, going out of state a good bit, actually, uh, mm. to find the stuff that I'm doing because of just the amount of people that are showing up. Uh, it's it's quite unreal. But with the rivers, like Tony was just talking about, uh, they down here when we have two or three inches of rain, it is no thing for a creek or a river to raise five to six feet. So if it raises that much, then you can imagine the amount of erosion that takes place in the banks of the river or the creek as well as the bottom, depending upon the river. So some rivers here have shoals or rock bottoms. Some have rock bottoms. Some have sand bottoms. Every creek responds differently to the rain. Thankfully, I have about six creeks that I cycle through uh, on a basis of one a week. So I go through them. I, after every rain, I go through it. I try to catch it. However, if I get there in their footprints, I know that I've been beat. Usually <laughs> if I've been beat, then it's time to go to the next creek. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, you're you're bringing you're bringing this excitement uh, really to the forefront with with all of your followings and stuff. So you're, you know, like you said, when when you're digging up the the towns on the bottles, people are they're going to get out there and try and, and get out and beat you out there. Yeah, and every every state's different. Here in Alabama, a lot of people are like, well, how do you have permission to walk miles and miles of a creek, right? Uh, you know, how do you have the landowner's permission for all of that? It's really kind of a gray area. Uh, here in Alabama, the law is if it's navigable, then it's public land. Mm -hmm. So if you can float a kayak or a canoe down it, then it's public. A lot of times I use an app called Onyx uh, to look up the landline. Yep, it's a great app. It'll tell me who the owner of the land is. And usually if the creeks say over 10 foot wide, then usually the property lines end at the creek bank. And the center part of the creek is going to be something that you can walk with no problem. Uh, after five years of doing this, I have never, not one time, have I had a landowner be upset with me. But usually if somebody comes and asks me, I'm always cordial. I tell them what I'm doing. And if they think that it's their land, I even offer them what I found. You know, mm. that, I'm not that kind of guy that I'm going to argue with you and tell you how wrong you are. <laughs> sure. Mm. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't take you as a, a confrontational kind of guy to, you know, sit there and read them the Geneva Convention and tell them they're wrong, you know, about <laughs> public land versus <laughs> private. So, right, and then even some of our dumps are on city land, and a lot of people are like, "Well, how did you get permission from the city?" Usually, we go to local law enforcement. Uh, you know, if there's a cop driving by, we talk with them. And there's one dump here in Birmingham that we dig that every digger that's in the southeast has probably put a shovel in at one point. <laughs> and that's because they were finding Coca-Cola Hutchinson bottles, which is the rarest Coke bottles in the world. And they fetch, you know, $2,500 to $10,000 a piece. So every treasure hunter that's a bottle digger has been here digging in this dump because they found five there. Now, at the end of the day, when we went there in the beginning, I've got to be completely honest, a decade ago, we didn't have permission. And before I got into the channel, I said, you know what? I need to do things right. I need to sh shed a positive light on the hobby. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want people to think that I'm doing things wrong. So there was a cop. I stopped and talked to him. Lo and behold, one of the nicest people I've ever talked to, to the point of now when we dig, we literally have local law enforcement pull up, ask us what we found, check on us, and make sure we're okay because some of these areas are incredibly dangerous. The yeah. crime rates are really high, especially the, the violent crime rates. 
uh, the, the risk of something happening to us is high in some of the areas that we go to. Uh, more than likely, it would be theft of a vehicle or something like that. But, the man, the local law enforcement has just been stand-up for us. I, we have had no problems with them, and they have supported us through and through, and I'm very thankful for that. That's awesome. Mm. That's incredible. Yeah. I was just looking through a chat. You start talking about stuff on this podcast, and then our listeners, especially those that are well listening live, just start throwing stuff up. They've already found that article, that item that I was looking for. Yeah, like people are just already throwing up links to. Oh, here's what it is, Ken. I was searching for days on Google trying to figure that out. <laughs> Couldn't find anything. These guys take two seconds, throw it right up in my face. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate that. It's great. <laughs> You know what I like about your your show, Brandon, and uh, and the stuff you found. And then, well, first, you've been out with. Uh, do you get out much with uh, exploring Alabama these days? We used to do a whole lot together, and he has a permission at one of our bottle dumps that we go to. And the landowner actually lives in Texas, and he looked up the landowner, contacted him, and he's a very well connected man in the state. So he's been able to score some permissions that I didn't have, and we've worked together on renting excavators and stuff like that to remove the bottles from the dump. Uh, thankfully, the landowner has been just so nice and so wonderful to us. And they're like, as long as you cover the holes back up, we don't care. And mm -hmm. it's been one of those things where me, we, we work together two or three times a year. And usually he's the kind of guy, he goes and finds anything and everything, and he films it all. <laughs> For me, I'm, I'm kind of niche specific. I'm following the lines of antique bottles or relics while I'm metal detecting. For him, he doesn't care what it is. He's going to find it. <laughs> Yeah. You remember that series of videos you had that time where he found that chain? It was partially buried. Yeah, oh, God. He turned millions it into like five or six videos, millions of views. <laughs> and all he millions was doing was trying to get that chain out. He was just going to take that chain out a little at a time. <laughs> <laughs> what was at the end yeah, of the chain, man? You create a mystery like that, and you're going to hook people so hard. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he called me. He's like, hey, man. He's like, I found this chain that's buried on the edge of the river up here. Do you want to come up here? And I was like, I was like, ah, I'm good. <laughs> you know, like, right. I, I, That's a I don't really want to. I don't want to dig a chain up out of the dirt. He's like, well, I just rented an excavator. I was like, what? <laughs> he's right. like, he's like, I pulled on this chain and it wouldn't come up. He's like, and I, I, I did a video and people really liked it. Well, he, what he didn't tell me is what he meant by really liked was three million views. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> or I would, or I would have took off work to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, there's probably a cow made. tag at the end of that chain. <laughs> I'm not taking off work. He's going to cut a cow tag. tag. Well, he had three episodes on that, and he scored like 10 million views and 20,000 YouTube subscribers. <laughs> and at the end of the chain, there was nothing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it just shows you the power of a uh, story mm -hmm. and people wanting, you know, completion to a, to what they get invested in and it's just amazing. You, you know, I look at that video all the time. I think about that video all the time is, especially if I'm making videos and thinking, oh, I don't have enough stuff for content, man. All I need is a chain. Yeah. <laughs> Sticking no out kidding. some dirt. You, somewhere, you know what I mean? You just gotta, you gotta, you know, you just gotta know what to do with it. Uh, what, what, what's your, it's just like you, you say you don't find everything every time. And you know, who else was like, this was a uh, uh, court order. Corridor always told me uh, yep. when I was chatting with him, he said, you know, Ken, I don't always find the greatest things, but I make the things I find great. I make the things I find interesting, you know, and or at least very I try wise. to. And I said, yeah, that's perfect. Because Tony very, and I always complain. Yeah, absolutely. You know, don't always find the amazing stuff, but try to make what I find interesting for people mm -hmm. and no matter what I find. And I know Tony and I are guilty of sometimes putting ourselves into a corner just like you were talking a minute ago yeah. about don't knock colorado bottles you know we'll be like oh man we're not in a colonial area oh man we're only really go back about 1950 or at the very earliest so we're not going to find large scents and we're not going to find this and that and oh man but you know what if you if you do the video right right you yeah. can make pull tabs and bottle caps interesting and uh and and and, and showcase the the journey to find those things, you know, the surroundings. Look at uh, Green Mountain Metal Tech and look at Brad, you know. Oh, he, yeah. It's more than just what he finds. It's it's the journey to get there. It's the journey of discovery and you know, what he learns about it in the back end. And, yeah, there's a, definitely a skill. Brad, definitely a skill. Brad is a great guy. Actually, we're going to be filming together uh, in a couple of weeks. We're going to spend a whole Saturday together, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, Are you really? Awesome. That's oh, awesome. Yeah, we're 
it's going to be an absolute blast. We've been talking for a couple of years now, and uh, we uh, we've been exchanging emails for a while, and then finally phone numbers. And you know, it's one of those things where you never know if you're going to give your phone number out to a rogue person, and then <laughs> you, right, get blown, right. you get blown up at one at two o'clock in the morning. But uh, no, me, me and him have a lot in common. You know, I think his son is six years old, my daughter's seven. We're both married. We're both uh, trying to give this creator thing a go, and uh, it's. It, it was one of those things where we just kind of hit it off, and I, I'm looking forward to doing some videos with him. Uh, it should be a great day. I'm hoping we find a lot, but you never know. Uh, right. But I'm, I'm very excited to work with him. Yeah, be sure to tell him hello from me for sure. Um, yeah, it's going to be a blast, man. I can't wait to see. And then, and then yeah. let me know, too, when the videos come out. I want to be able to check that out. <laughs> You're going to have a blast. Absolutely. You're going up there? You're going up there? Oh, uh, We're, we're going to meet in the middle. Okay. All right. So, we'll, so when we're down for dig stock together, we're gonna meet up and spend a whole day together there. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's cool. great. We need to get out to another dig stock. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got to let this England trip sink in for a little while, and then, and then hit it, hit it. Um, I've, I've never been, guys. So this will be my very first dig stock. Oh, you're gonna have a great time. You're gonna have a great time. Now, are you yeah, going I'm, out I'm, there with Garrett? Are you, uh, I am you going are out associated with, Garrett. with I, Garrett. I am. I'm one of their team members, one of their field team members, and uh, I will be out there with the Garrett crew at their tent hanging out. So if any of the listeners are going to be there, be sure to come by and say hello. Uh, if I'm not out swinging the detector, uh, come come hit me up and talk with me. I, I'd be more than happy to talk with you and talk about bottles or whatever you want to. But I, I'm really looking forward to the trip, though. Uh, sadly, my wife and daughter, because my daughter's in school, are not going to be able to make it. Oh. So I will be flying solo on it. I did talk <laughs> with Matt Howell from Gone Digging. I think he may shack up with me a night or two in the hotel room. So, <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, that's great. So, so we're gonna we're gonna have a good time regardless. Yeah, we. Uh, I had a blast. So in 2019, when it was a pound of ground, I had an absolute blast. I'll still think about that trip. We had so much fun. I went out there with Jeff Lubert and uh hooked up with everybody it was just it was like a family reunion you know you you, you watch these you at least i did because of the weekly dirt i'd watch tons of video and get to know tons of channels and reach out and, and touch base and so you start feeling like you know some of these people that make these videos at least i did felt very close to them and you know get get a chance to put face to face and and chat with them and stuff and uh see what they're like off camera was absolutely amazing man like you know uh liz up in canada and just like uh, you know the jersey history hunter people and all kinds of different people you know the plugmaster ford and uh quarter Horde and all these guys it was our first time kind of getting together and, and seeing each other. we talked forever you know but uh never really got together so you're gonna have a blast man hey and you know what you need oh, to mention yeah. to garrett you know what you need to mention here? Just, <laughs> just drop this on the fly sometime, but you yep. just tell them. Rush to the Rockies 2023 in July in Colorado. They need to send you out. Yep. They need to send you out. I can do that. I talked, to, uh, I talked to Steve Moore yesterday, actually. He was talking with me. I've got multiple hunts that I'm going to be attending. Uh, we Back in October, we went to uh, Treasure Fest 5 in Arkansas with Brandon Sutton. Hmm fantastic hunt had a great time there we were also were at treasure treasure fest four but at five i was able to hang out with quarter quarter and uh this year we decided that to make it a goal the organized hunts have never been our thing so we decided hey let's step out on a limb try something new and once we did treasure fest and we did uh oh four to hunt uh four to hunt six and seven i think i went to both of those i can't remember Mm -hmm. and i said man this is absolutely a blast so Steve said, well, hey, what events do you want to go to? I said, well, I absolutely want to do the Garrett Memorial Hunt. I definitely want to do Dick Stock. And he said, well, hey, let me know on this other stuff. And he was emailing me about the Garrett Memorial Hunt. And I'm very excited to go to Texas for it in April. Are, are either of you guys going to be there? Nope. <laughs> no. uh, nope. Uh, we have a huge contingency going from our treasure hunting club. Uh, the Eureka Treasure Hunters Club. So we have a huge contingency going because we support that hunt every year. We make donations and we give prize prize donations from our treasure hunting club. And we go out there. And uh, so our treasure hunting club has been around since 1973. We're having our 50-year Golden Jubilee celebration this year. And um, Garrett historically has always, uh, over the years, taken care of our club. Uh, There's a special connection there. And, um, they just, they send stuff for our Christmas party. Like they, you know, for the, for all of our events, like we, we, this is our 24th rush to the Rockies event. 
we had to take a few years off because of COVID, but we had our first one yeah. in a long time last year. And then this year we'll follow up and I, I think we'll continue on. But Garrett is just steps up every year um, throughout the man, different stuff we need. And they're just an excellent company. And uh, oh, so man, there's, being family owned and being in the U S it's, it's such a huge thing to me. And they're I, the way that I would, you know, they're, they're not a, a company they're a family i mean that's the best way that i can explain it uh, there may be other companies out there releasing three detectors a month or whatever but at the end of the day these guys are the ones that are out there looking out for these smaller hunts and you know really providing a lot of metal detectors for giveaways and all that kind of stuff and that's the kind of company i want to be associated with yeah garrett's yeah. always been great for that and uh you know supporting the community real well and yeah, we'd love to have you out. So talk to Steve about it. Uh, I know yeah. that I think our our contact at Garrett through other people in our club that handle. I'm in charge of all the donations for the um, for the for the uh, events last year and this year. I'd say I volunteer again like a crazy guy, <laughs> but uh, uh, somebody in our club's got a real tight connection with Garrett, and they always are the ones that reach out to them. And I don't think they reach out to Steve. I think they reach out to somebody else, like Brian over there or something. And uh, so right. yeah, but, but mention it to Steve yeah, July, early July after the fourth, weekend mm -hmm. after the fourth, and uh, yeah, we'd hey, love well, to have you out, see you out there. Well, well, let me know, Ken. I'd love to support you, even if I can't come. I'll send you a bunch of T-shirts, stickers, you know, maybe even a few bottles or something like that to give oh, away. Oh man, that'd be amazing. Be there, I'd, that'd I'd be great. That. Well, hey, great, wow. man. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll we'll take you up on that for sure. I know that uh, you know everyone coming out. It was cool. We had some people that came out this last uh, event that were listeners to the show here uh, and then also watchers of our YouTube channel. So they were able to come <laughs> up and, and yeah. say hello and uh, and meet us. And that's always welcome, too. We, we appreciate you guys uh, coming up and saying hello all the time. But, uh, hey, we appreciate that. That's cool. I know that, you know, yeah. we, we try to get all the manufacturers involved because this is, you know, one big community. And, uh, you know, the manufacturers that step up to support the community, we want to make sure we give them an opportunity to do that. And I know that, uh, you know, Nocta was was uh, stepped up last year, too. And then they've, uh, you know, they've they've vowed to kind of do that again this year. They were kind of our main sponsor last year, uh, even though Garrett uh, brought the goods and, and just, you know, stepped up, too. Uh, it was great. You know, this year I'm trying to hope to maybe get somebody else out, a couple other people, mm -hmm. maybe a shovel guy. I think uh, Casey with Excalibur Shovels talked about maybe oh, coming yeah. out and, uh, you know, just demonstrating some of his stuff. And so we're just getting yeah. going. Like I said, we just got the dates final, final, final uh, two days ago. So, Hey, Casey and I, we talk pretty regularly. I'm, I'm set up as a dealer for his shovels. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's a, man, he's a great guy. I guess being in Utah, y'all aren't too far apart. <laughs> no, we're not. No, no. Uh, I want to go out there and find some of those Mormon oh, gold geez, coins, right, yeah. Tommy? <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, he was on the show talking about those Mormon gold coins. I looked those things up, and I fell in love. <laughs> I I've got to find one of those things. Yeah, pretty amazing looking. Yeah. Never seen them, never even yeah, heard no, them before. No, but... beautiful coins. Jeez. Man, he, he is a great guy, too, man. Yeah. Uh, to, to go from building exhaust systems for NASCAR to, <laughs> right? to, to building shovels. I mean, the, I, I've been supporting him for quite a while because that's all that's the only shovel that I've used for the last four years. And, you know, he's really, really perfected what he's doing now, man. It's, it's unreal. I have one of his two-piece shovels. Do y'all have one of those? No, he was just telling us about yeah. it. We just had him on as a guest like two guests ago or two shows ago. And he was telling oh, us all man. about it, but man, I, you know, I thought Ooh, so that'd be good man, for traveling. Got one Called the Merlin. I got one of those shovels, and I thought for sure it was going to be rickety, right? You know, being two pieces, <laughs> like there's no way this thing's going to be sturdy. And yeah. I was like, I really wanted it to be two pieces because I got the longest handle he could have because of the way we dig at the bottom of these holes. A lot of times we're undermining, mm -hmm. so we don't want to have a hand trowel reaching four foot up underneath of a 15 foot bank that's you know two tons of dirt. So the yeah. longer the shovel, the better for us to be able to reach while we're undermining. So I was like, well, hey, how long of a shovel? I can't remember how long it is. It's over 50 inches, though. And when he got, I said, I don't want it to be completely that long because sometimes whenever I'm going to these places, I'm either on a four-wheeler, I'm on a motorcycle, I'm on whatever to be able to get to it. It's not someplace yeah. I can get to with a car. So he was like, hey, well, I've got this breakdown shovel. I was like, well, hey, look, hook me up. Let's get one. Let's see what it looks like. He sent it to me. Man, that thing, you would never know it was two pieces. Absolutely amazing shovel. <laughs> didn't he say it is didn't someone yeah. take it to england did uh i thought he mentioned maybe somebody had taken it to england uh recently yeah 
I don't know. When we go to England, man, they give. Yeah, when we go to England, they 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 supply the shovels when we get there. They have these really like narrow spades, long handles. You know, you just drag them behind you, and they work real well in the soil over there. Uh, absolutely loved it, and then you just leave them there and you split. So you bring your hand digger, and that's usually it, uh, especially on the uh, you know organized trips that we're going yeah. on. But uh, yeah, you know, Casey sent me a Sir K real early on, and I've been using it ever since, and it just. Now, I will say that it didn't get through the ice here in Colorado <laughs> last well weekend. Uh, but, you know, the, neither did uh, Tony's big monster. So no, no. it was uh, it's just the ground that we were in. But I'll tell you, if with like roots and anything yeah. like that, that, that K just really cuts through real well. And I, I've been using it ever since he sent it. Like you said, probably like you in about the past four years or so. But um, yep. no, what did, what did Tim ask him, Tony? Tim had asked him... Um, he was coming out with a field, a field show. The field, yeah, it's going to be wider. Yeah, wider and, yeah. yeah. I guess he is. Uh, I just don't think he's ready to announce and do stuff with it yet, or actually put it out. But um, looking forward to that. Yeah, that'd be great. Imagine a cirque with a wider spade on right. it, with a you know bigger foot peg. That would be that'd be ideal. I'm looking forward to that. Oh, he does have a lot a wider footland now, and I will say this: it does make a difference if you're in hard soil. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I bet it does. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, and even slippery stuff. Like I was uh, <laughs> worried about my foot slipping off the shovel and it raking my shin. You know, <laughs> yeah, when you you slip off those those uh, those pegs, but uh, yeah. What uh, what's new for you, Brandon? Like what um, <clears throat> what do you got coming up? What what do you, uh, oh, first of all, in the, in the chat, um, Ohio Relic Hunter wanted to ask you a question. He said that uh, he wanted to know what a 2023 Budweiser bottle is worth because he has quite a few of those. <laughs> if, he's, if, if he's got a full case, then I'll give him 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and help him drink it. Let's go. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, sounds good. So what's next with you? You got any big trips coming up besides uh, dig stock? You got uh, we got you should you should do a big in. bottle digging uh, event with a I'm, small amount of people. I'm I'm kind of working on that in the background. I've got a whole lot going on right now. I'm I'm actually <laughs> developing a bottle tumbler line, which is what cleans antique bottles. Uh, there currently is only one other competitor in the market, and he's trying to sell his company. And I was kind of interested in it until I found out how much he wanted for it. And then I was like, oh, man, you know, half a million dollars is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> so I, decided, I decided to start from the ground up and uh, try to design my own. We're about two years in now, and I know that sounds like a long time, but when you're trying to source materials and stuff like that, it's a huge deal. And then I ran into a space issue at the house. So if you hear echo in the background, I'm actually standing in a shop that I'm in the middle of building right now. Nice. Uh, that's going to be, uh, if you will, the Adventure Archaeology Headquarters, which just stands for a large garage. <laughs> but, but, but through the magic but, of video, it's, it's going to look like your headquarters building, right? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's exactly right. I, I will have a 10 by 10 uh, office in here that will be heated and air conditioned that will have a top-of-the-line 3D printer. It will have a laser etching machine for engraving serial numbers, etc., for the bottle tumbler side of it. And I did release a new product here a couple weeks ago called Digger's Dust. This is what goes inside of the tube uh, of the tumbler while the bottle's being cleaned. It's a 1,200-grit uh, silicon carbide, and it cuts a very small layer of glass off while leaving a polish. Of course, we got a little bit of a special additive in there that turns this, turns this into a polish at about the seven-day mark after tumbling. And uh, we are very excited. It launched very, very successfully, actually more successfully successfully than i wanted it to be because now i'm trying to rush and get everything into canisters and oh, wow. <laughs> it's, wow. one of, it's, one, it's one of those scenarios but at the end of the day i'd much rather it be more successful than not successful enough sure. uh, but that stuff has been taken precedent over a lot of other things so my editing quality has been down the last few months i'm going to try to bring that back up to par but uh, i still work a full-time job and it's become a real hassle to try to keep everything going at once uh, who knows? Maybe in the next six months, y'all might see me step out on a, a, a limb and become a full-time creator. Uh, that's the goal. I think that's everybody's goal that does YouTube. Uh, yeah. I think I'm to the point where I can do it, but uh, we'll, we'll just have to see how that goes. Awesome. Fingers crossed for you, man. I'll yeah. root for you 100%. Um, 
you know, uh, if anybody deserves to do that and do what you love and, and you know, do it, make a living out of it, 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 it's you and and others I know that are very committed and serious about, you know, the process of creating videos and, and being honest about it and you know, serving the community. You, you do a great job with it. So I was going to ask you how you clean bottles, uh, but maybe you don't want to tell me now about no, the no, process. I can, I can, <laughs> like for, for the layman out there that finds a bottle, like, like I was surprised to hear that you tumble them. Like that's, I don't know so, anything about cleaning uh, bottles. If but. you if you could picture a rock tumbler, I mean basically it's the same thing except for the tube where your rocks would go has something called stopples. So if you could picture a cone, the cone part would go into the inside of the neck of the bottle, and then on the back you have something called what I like to call fingers. Anyways, picture four fingers and they hold the heel of the bottle. So your bottle will slip down inside of the fingers. The cone will go into the neck of the bottle and it'll keep your bottle centered inside of a tube. So you think, well, what are you going to put in there that's going to clean this bottle? Well, it's copper. Uh, You need 12 or 14 gauge copper cut into 25 thousandths lengths. So to give you an idea, your hair on your head is 3 thousandths. So if you multiply that times about eight, uh, that's the diameter of the copper pieces that would be used that go inside of it. You fill the tube up about halfway with copper. Then you're going to put a tablespoon of my digger's dust, preferably, that I just released (laughs) inside of it. And a a teaspoon on the inside. And you turn this thing loose and you let it run for about three days. At the end of the three-day mark, you flip your tube 180 degrees. You run it another three days. Then when you pull your bottle out, it looks brand new like you took it off of the shelf. It's one of the only things that you can do to take care of sickness, which is what the uh, the mineral deposits on the outside of the bottle. I don't know if you've ever dug one that mm-hmm. kind of has like an iridescent look yeah. or looks really cloudy and you can't get it off. Well, this is the only way to get it off. Amazing, and you put out you put out some videos though. Uh, I'm sure old old machines, but you kind of explained it on your YouTube channel as well, right? I have. I've got a couple of videos. Uh, in the very beginning, I was experimenting with a rock tumbler five years ago. There was nothing keeping the bottle centered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ran into major issues. I mean, it was so it was so crude <laughs> and so elementary that I look back and think, why did I even make that video? <laughs> but you know. You know, 80,000 people later that watched it. Right. I was going <laughs> to say, it, it, it was an interesting I, video. That's the reason why you put it out there. And then, you know, last year, I, uh, I used the competitors. Now, Tumblr did a video on it, it just to show the process. Uh, obviously, mine's going to be following in suit to it. Uh, the competitor is the top-notch Tumblr. And I will tell you this, his Tumblr will continue to be better than mine. And I'm not going to lie about that. But the price point is going to be much, much higher than where mine lands at. Uh, just to give you a ballpark, if you buy a nice tumbler for my competitor, you're going to spend a couple thousand dollars. So yeah. this is not a this is not a low end item. This is not for your guy that's going to uh, you know find one bottle a year and want to clean it. This is more for your hardcore guys. So I'm trying to develop uh, a, an economical tumbler, something that's going to uh, be more affordable for the guys that find five or six bottles a year that don't do it every week that they don't have to go, hey, I'm going to have to take out a second mortgage to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I mean, how many bottles can you can you dig and clean if it's taking you six days per bottle? That's the thing right there. So it's time. Uh, right now, what the one that I'm developing, you're going to be able to turn one bottle at a time. At any given time right now in my shop, I'm turning six bottles at a time. So I have six running at a time, uh, and with all six of them running – in seven days, I can pull those six out, uh, and I can decide whether it's going to run a little bit longer, whether I'm going to keep it, whether I'm going to sell it. Is it something that I don't have in my collection or I do? And it just opens up this huge door. Now, at the end of the day, it's a large, long process of taking these bottles in and out, cleaning them, and a lot of people don't realize how much work goes into it. It's mm-hmm. definitely a labor of love. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh People had asked me, I think they asked me uh, last time you were on, we had John, <clears throat> and your answer shocked me. But since then, I've, I've come to know this about you, <clears throat> and, uh, is what you do with all those broken bottles, because you find a lot of broken bottles versus whole bottles. And, uh, you know, I would just be like, well, you probably just, you know, clean up the earth and pitch them all, you know, in the trash, and, and, uh, and that's what you do, but it shocked me when you said you found a purpose for those broken bottles. Why don't you tell us about that? So some people are not alcohol fans. So we're going to, we're going to refer to these as just drinking glasses, but a lot of times if a bottle's going to break, it's going to break on the neck of the bottle. 
So if you're a bottle digger or you're a mud larker and you're walking a creek and you're finding bottles that have broken necks, I actually found a guy in Florida that I've been working with. His name is Nicholas Weathersby, and he is an artist. And he is one of the best guys I've ever dealt with. And it doesn't matter if you're me or if you're anybody else. He charges the same price for everybody. But he charges $18, and you send him your broken bottle, and he sends this thing back cut in half and completely ground to a round lift to where this thing looks like an amazing double-shot whiskey glass. Wow. And I've been using Nicholas now for a couple of years. Uh, could I do it myself? Absolutely. He's told me his secret, and there is a secret <laughs> to it that I ne I've never shared on my channel, and I never will just for his sake. Uh, the thing for me is time. So, yep. yeah, it's $18 that has, that has to be invested, but I usually send him eight or ten bottles at a time. Uh, they come back. They go into my tumblers. I clean them, and then they are sold on the eBay store. And those that are sold go back into my YouTube channel and my Facebook page, and that helps provide camera gear, travel expenses, etc. And right now I cannot find enough broken bottles to supply <laughs> the demand. And a lot of people have tried to do exactly what I'm doing and sell them, and they have had absolutely zero luck. So I don't want you to think that you can do this and go sell them easily. For me, what I found out, the people that buy them from me love the fact that they can see them found on the channel and they have a complete story. So it becomes a conversation piece of sorts for them. And a lot of these guys are whiskey collectors. So the guys that are drinking whiskey that have, you know, a couple thousand dollars in uh, bottles of liquor laying around, they're the guys that want to buy one of these glasses. Hmm. And they have it right dead center of their case usually, which is really cool to see these things being used again after well over a century. Love it. Amazing. Well, there you go. If you're a bottle digger out there in the world in the United States and you are wondering what to do with your broken glasses, send them to Brandon. He can repair, yeah, he can use them. Yeah, he <laughs> you're going to get a you ton, can... you're gonna ton of broken glass. <laughs> <aren't you? laughs> well, in all honesty, that's the thing is I've had a very, a very large amount of people reach out to me and offer to send me glasses. I'm very hesitant to take, uh, you know, the broken bottles right. from people and sell them because to be completely honest with you, people don't buy them unless they saw them found on the channel. They right. just really right. love it. Having a complete story of, Hey, I saw where this was found. I know who found it. <laughs> I know what it went through to get cleaned, tumbled, cut, repolished and brought back to life. And they have a full story, whereas if I take one from somebody and they can't relate it to a video, sure. it's not nearly as well-received by my audience, I've noticed. Yeah. I got, three, I got three words for you. What's that? Crazy crazy lamp lady. There you go. Yep. Oh, yeah, you're exactly oh, right. <laughs> oh, same story, man. Same yep. exact thing. People love to buy her stuff that she shows on her thrifting channel that she finds and puts on eBay. And I mean, she <laughs> says straight up, like, what she bought it for, what she's going to list it for. And you know who's one of them? My sister. My sister in California yep. absolutely loves her channel because she says she has the same taste as she does and absolutely loves it and is on buying her stuff off eBay all the time because she just saw her, you know, get that on the video you know two months ago and now she can buy it on ebay and it's that well, connection it's more than just the item you know what i mean oh absolutely and i'll give you for instance one of my best customers is in ohio and they're opening up a time period correct saloon so if you will they're opening up a saloon that was going to look exactly like you walked into it in the wow. 1900s wow. so the owner of the saloon called me and they're like we love what you're doing we'll buy every glass you make for the next year and i'm like <laughs> i'm like well if i do that i'm going to alienate all of my other customers so right I, I sold them a large batch in the beginning and then i feed them one here or there but i couldn't do it to the rest of the people that want these bottles and that was the other side of it that we can get into away from the glasses is that we find a lot of broken glass that's not usable that can't be used or turned into a glass and my wife is an artist. A lot of people don't know that. She loves to paint. She's always been very artistic. And we were talking about it, and she says, I love this beautiful glass. I wish there was something I could do with it. I said, there is. There's people that make sea glass earrings and necklaces and stuff all the time. Do you think you can do it? She said, if you buy me the stuff to do it, I can do it. So we went out and invested a lot of money into, you know, diamond drill bits and dremels and drill presses and you name it. And at the end of the day, she got very good at making jewelry and out of broken pieces of glass that we find in our videos. And that's been a huge hit with the ladies on the channel. They love it. They love to buy it. They love to show it off. They share the pictures. And at the end of the day, we're doing the environment of service as well. We're taking broken glass out that won't harm people at swimming holes. We're not worried about the wildlife there. 
and we're picking up just tons and tons of this stuff. Last year, I think we picked up, I was calculating every year I was weighing it whenever I got home each week. And I think we took 1,200 pounds of broken glass out last year. Jeez. <laughs> My gosh. My gosh. <laughs> that is just crazy. But good on you, man. Well, that's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I threw the uh, link to your eBay store over in the chat, in the live chat. And if uh, you're listening after the show tonight, you can actually find it in yeah. the description down below as well. I was just poking around over there, and, and it looks like, I mean, you've got uh, three sets of earrings from your wife. You've got some bottles up there. you got your digger's dust. I mean, that's great. I'm going to be yeah. I will say that before yeah. I will say that before the show, we talked about it. we talked about uh, your eBay store, and I know that's not why you came on right. here. You, right, You didn't want to come on here to pitch your eBay store. I know, I know, we talked about that, but it's really interesting, man. I think it's one of the, you know, it's a really interesting part of your story, of what you do with that stuff that you you know you can't collect and you can't do that. You're repurposing it, and people love it. The question I would have is, so let me ask you this: Does the brand of glass, uh, the brand of bottle, like it would be, so different bottles are, are different, are collectible by different values and such. Do Does that also translate into the drinking glasses or, in other words, like a Hutch drinking glass going to be better than a Coca-Cola bottle drinking glass or vice versa or does it really just pertain to what they saw you dig on the video? that it can help increase I have the never, value. I've never turned a bottle that's newer than 1930 into a drinking glass. So to give you an idea, everything's going to be at least 100 years old or a century old is my goal. Uh, they do dictate different values. Now, I will tell you this. I figured out this is no kidding. I listed one of these glasses uh, last year or the year before, and I put it on auction. And I, I, I you know, I've, I usually don't run auctions. I usually run stuff as buy it now, and I'm about to explain why. That glass sold for $450 for one glass, and it was a common bottle. And it was one of those things where I was sick. I was like, I feel bad. This bottle complete wouldn't have sold for $30. So I ended up contacting the buyer, and he was a firefighter in Mississippi. And I was like, hey, man, I got to tell you, did you do this on accident? He said, no, I really want it, and I want to support your channel. <laughs> I said, as much as, I'd appreci- as much as I appreciate that, there was an underbidder, too. I said, I want you to know there's an underbidder. I said, if you did this on accident, I said, I'll absolutely contact the underbidder, and we'll go with them. I said, I just don't want you to think I'm taking advantage of you. And this guy was like, no. And what I figured out is is these guys that are paying up for some of these common bottles are people that absolutely enjoy the channel, and this is their way of supporting them. So instead of sending super chats or uh, fan mail mm. or whatever, I don't have a P.O. box. If people want to support the channel, that's where I tell them. I said, hey, go to eBay. At least you get something to show for your donation, and I appreciate everything that you do. So I decided from that point forward I was no longer going to list these things on auction. I was going to put a buy it now price. And that has created a bit of a demand issue because as soon as the buy it now ones go up, they sell immediately. Right. Now, if they were on auction, people have time to think about it. They, you know, it doesn't sell as fast. And ultimately, it bids it up to where some people couldn't afford it. So I want it to be a fair game for everybody, depending on whether or not they have a large billfold. That does not matter to me. So I'm not trying to do this to get rich or I would run everything on auction. Everything's on buy it now. If you look at my store, I'm sure Tony can tell you that. Yep. Uh, the reason for that is I don't want stuff to run up. I don't want to take advantage of people. I want them to be able to enjoy this stuff. So the buy it now stuff, I just list it on there. As it comes up, it goes. So if you look, there's no drinking glasses on the store. That's because they literally sell out in the first hour that I list them. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. Wow. That is crazy. That is crazy. So Amazing. They will, there That's will be. Amazing. I usually try to list about 10 a month. That's about all I find broken bottle-wise. Uh, that's not a lot. You know, that's 120 a year. Uh, therefore, I, like I said, there's, I could take donations from people that have broken bottles. A lot of times I try not to do that. Sometimes they're local diggers. I will take their bottles because I know what's going to happen. They're just going to rebury them if I don't. <laughs> and I, just, I would hate to see that history just disappear. Hmm. Pretty cool, man. I yeah, I, I see them for sale uh, from time to time. I always think they're really cool, and I thought, wow, oh, yeah. It always reminds me of what you do with those with those bottles, and it's a, it's always really cool. So, okay, real quick, we're kind of running out of time, but give me your white whale. What's your uh, what's the one bottle mm. you know you can find out there in Alabama that you just haven't yet? There's two. So the first one's going to be obviously the Coca Cola Hutchinson from Birmingham or Bessemer, Alabama. I would take a Jasper. There was only eight 
there were only eight Coca-Cola Hutchinsons made, and these were all in the southeast. So if you're going to find a Coca-Cola Hutch, you're going to either have to be in Tennessee, Georgia, or Alabama, more than likely, unless somebody traveled by train someplace to drop one in a trash can. Uh, though, any of those eight, I would absolutely love. I've been within feet of them being dug, and I've dug halves and pieces of them, but I've never dug a complete one. Uh, I know I will eventually. It's just going to take some time, but at the end of the day, I'll never let that discourage me. Like you said, it's the white well. It's what keeps you going, right? You never know when you're going to dig one. Uh, the second thing is going to be a Jack Daniels from Birmingham, Alabama. Everybody thinks about Lynchburg, Tennessee, when they think about Jack Daniels because that's where the distillery is. Well, it was actually distilled in Birmingham for a short period of time, as well as in a couple of other places. The reason that wow. they are a very valuable bottle here in Alabama is because the company was only open for around a year. And I went to Lynchburg, Tennessee, and actually talked to a couple of their master distillers and asked them, hey, why was this bottle only made for one year? And they told me that the limestone in the cave there that they get the water from that they distill into the whiskey is what makes the flavor so good obviously the oak barrels have something to do with it but that lime water made all the difference so when they opened up these other distilleries in different towns like in birmingham they didn't have the lime sown water mm. coming out of a cave they were just trying to use regular water and it affected the taste to the extent to where they couldn't sell it so they had to close all of these other companies down wow so i would love to find i would love to find one of the jack daniels bottles from birmingham that's definitely on my list <sighs> And hopefully I'll dig one of those one day. Oh, I can't wait to see see that video when when you find yeah. it. That's going to be incredible. Yeah, we dug a half of one. Oh, we dug a half oh, of did one. Did you really? Oh. <laughs> well, it wasn't from Birmingham. It was from Lynchburg, Tennessee. I actually went to Nashville to dig it. Uh, we went to Nashville. One of the local diggers up there, his name's Wyatt. He's a younger guy. Him and his dad have been digging for years. They have a huge bottle collection. He said, "Hey, I've got an awesome place. Come up here and dig with us." Uh, mm -hmm. First off, it was the first bottle we found from the 1860s in Nashville. It was a beautiful cobalt soda. Uh, absolutely blew our mind. We moved down the hill a little bit from where we were digging, and I kid you not, he pulls out a Lynchburg, Tennessee Jack Daniels bottle from the turn of the century. Oh, absolutely wow. blows my mind. You know, it's a you know, $500, $800 bottle, you know, somewhere in that range, depending on the condition and the collector that's bidding or trying to buy it. Right. Uh, then it was my turn, and I was like, I see a neck. I'm going to dig it. I start digging. I was like, it's my turn. I'm going to need a Jack Daniels. i got to pull it out. Mine's broken half. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. My gosh. Hey, we got a caller online. Denny, you're on with uh, Brandon, Nicholas, Tony, and myself. How are you, Denny? Hey, Denny. I'm pretty good. Hey, Brandon, uh, have you ever repaired bottles? Ooh, good question. No, sir, I have not. I know this, I know of a couple people that do it, and I do have one that I, I do. want to have repaired. Oh. You do? Yes, sir. Well, when we dig in Virginia and dig Civil War relics, uh, we dig a lot of bottles, even, even though they're broke. If we can find all the pieces, which we usually do, we use Ducco cement. And when you're working with it, you can work with it. It doesn't set up right away, but when it does, it's good forever. Hmm. Do you so are, you cutting, are you cutting the, uh, the bad spots out, say like you have a neck broken off? Are you cutting it off and then replacing it with another neck? Or are you talking about no. a complete shattered one back together? The, the necks, when they were not breaking those off, they broke them off with a bayonet or a knife. That's how they opened a wine bottle. How many soldiers do you think carried a wine uh, screw or a corkscrew? <laughs> yeah, yeah. None. <laughs> and, every, and you see hundreds of bottles cut off at an angle, and you think, well, uh, they, re they destroyed that bottle somehow. Well, duh. And then uh, when they did that, they also put a... Uh, a strainer or a cloth over it. Then they poured the uh, bottle of wine or whatever it was to get the broken glass out of it. Then they could drink drink the wine or the beer or whatever it might be. Hmm. So you just pull the pieces out of the pit, Denny, and just put it together like a puzzle, and then use the uh, exactly. duck, we do duck that over it wherever you need to. Not, not just bottles, uh, dishes, and all kinds of things. Of course we do. Uh, what kind of coke bottle? Are we, ah, excuse me. What kind of coke bottle was you talking about? It's the, the Hutchinson style bottle, the one that some people refer to as a blob top. And I think it started in 1873, and by 1912, it was done. So it's not as old as the Civil War stuff as you're finding. Uh, obviously, right. Coca-Cola is not either because John Pemberton, who invented Coca-Cola, you know, the reason he invented it was because of a Civil War injury. <laughs> so yeah. at, the, at, at the end of the day, it's not as old. But like I said earlier, the age does not dictate the value to the collectors. So uh, those bottles that we're finding are right from around 1900 to 1901. 
and that's sure. right where I want to be to find the Coca-Cola hutch that I'm looking for. The, uh, we, I, my buddy found a brown one here in Ohio, a Coca-Cola bottle, and at that time it was worth around $400. Uh, they were turned down uh, a lot of houses, which was setting over a city dump, and we dug the, that bottle out of there. I also dug a clear Coca-Cola bottle with two hearts on each side from Lyme, Ohio. And uh, wow. as far as I know, I, I about just have the only one that's ever been found. And, but it, it came from Ohio, and we don't have anything left here, so don't come over. Don't come <laughs> over. <laughs> He's been saying that all show. Yeah. He's been yeah. discouraging people all show. <laughs> Very good show. I looked at. Yeah. In fact, I'm watching. I got your uh, how to clean a bottle up, and I want to know more about that because I have a lot of bottles that are ugly inside. So uh, I do. Well, I do bottle detect in the lakes when I'm metal detecting, and you can find them with your feet. I always use dive boots, and you can feel them with your feet. And I've got tons of bottles with names of cities on the bottom. Like Coca Cola mm. bottles with the names on the bottom of them. So that's pretty yeah. cool. Hmm. If yeah, the one that you were talking about is amber, it would have been a straight side Coke. So it would have been pre-1915. So, I mean, you're talking about 107 years old at least. Yeah, uh, that's so, right. I mean, yep. Yeah. Wow. It, but but at the end of the day, you're right. I do the same thing whenever I'm mudlarking or walking through these creeks. When I'm wearing waders, I'll take my foot and I'll drag it across the bottom <laughs> if something looks like a bottle. And if it's slick, it's usually a bottle. If it's kind of rough, it's a rock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got it. Bender yeah. done that. Yeah, hey, and you'll show you guys. Yeah, and Thanks we'll let you go, Denny. But I'll tell Thanks, you what, Denny. I got one more thing to say to you. You keep telling us there's not much stuff left in Ohio, <laughs> but you just got a D2, my friend. I saw you picked up uh -huh. a D2, and uh, you wouldn't be picking up a D2 if there wasn't much left in Ohio. Truth. So, well, um, I, I actually just dug a fish scale this week. Oh, from Canada, 1870. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. I thought it was a half time, but it's even smaller than a half time. It is crazy. Man, yeah. good hey, for Ken. you. Hey, Ken, hey, Ken yeah. when we go into Ohio. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Best we say that every show. I'll tell you that. And bottle digging, obviously. So Apparently. Go. Yeah, for sure. Let's go. All right, Danny, have a good night. Good night, Danny. Yeah, bye -bye. We'll see you, yeah. Hey, Brandon, I, uh, I, real quick, I know we're trying to get off here, but uh, I pulled up eBay. I found a... It says antique Coca-Cola hutch bottle circa 1900, glass Dixie, empty misspelled cocoa, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yep. $7,500. Yeah, he's a little bit high. But <laughs> that, that's a little bit high. But it, it, there's, a Birmingham, there's a Birmingham listed right now in a Tuskegee. The Tuskegee has a fractured lip. They still want $1,500 as a starting bid. Jeez. The Birmingham has lip damage as well. It's starting at 3000 right now, if you look. They both will sell. Uh, so if you're on eBay, go Amazing. watch those and you watch them sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll give you an idea of why I do what I do. <laughs> I understand. I don't question at all. I think you're a smart man. <laughs> One more question. It'll be the last question of the night. We'll let you say your goodbyes, and then uh, Tony and I will play the music out, and then we'll say our goodbyes off air if you're okay with that. But last question of the night, probably the most important question, came from Teresa the Treasure Hunter. I don't know if she's still in here, but she asked, Brandon, when do you actually get to sleep? Because <laughs> You're going, going, you're, going. You're a, you're a busy guy, man. I really, uh, in all honesty, everybody I talk to says the same thing to me. They're like, how do you juggle as much as you do? And the only reason I think that I can juggle what I do is because of how much I love it. If this wasn't a, a passion of mine, I don't think I could do it. If I was doing this just for the money side, I would have done quit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, there's, there, there is a ton of things that go into this that a lot of people don't know. Like in my tomorrow's video that I'm going to be releasing, uh, for instance, I hired an animator. So I'm working with an animator. I've got an editor that I'm working with that I have not used before. Uh, there's a lot of backside of this that a lot of people don't think about when you're running channels, especially when you got multiple platforms like me uh, with Facebook and YouTube and TikTok and you name it, Instagram. Uh, a lot of the platforms end up taking the wayside, and you got to pick your favorite. Absolutely, YouTube is still my favorite. But <laughs> you would look at it and go, well, Brandon, you've only got 66,000 subscribers on there. Why is that your favorite when your Facebook is – you know, almost 600,000. Well, right. I mean, at the end of the day, YouTube's my baby. That's where I started. I love it. The people on there, the community on there is a lot more wholesome. It's a lot more upbeat. Uh, Facebook, sadly, you hit a lot of haters. <laughs> but, at, <laughs> yeah. but, at, but, but at the end of the day, the passion side of it's fantastic. But, I mean, anywhere you go, there's going to be somebody that thinks, 
or they, they, they are dead set that they know more than you do. You pull something out of a river, it's either too clean or it's not dirty enough, and they oh, think yeah. that you put it there. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. you know, it, I, there's a lot of that stuff going on nowadays. But I can guarantee you this. If you watch my channel, we're the realest channel on Facebook. <laughs> there's weeks that we find, we find absolutely nothing. And I still make a video because, like I said, I just don't want to falsely represent a hobby and let people think that they're going to find something every single week. That's just not doable. If somebody's finding something awesome every single week, I guarantee you they're fake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just doesn't happen. Except for it's Tony and I. It's Tony and I, we're finding stuff awesome every week. <laughs> oh, every, awesome every night. Awesome caps, awesome pull oh. tabs. I mean, it, it's all awesome, Did man. you see that nail? Ooh, no, it was mint. Was so awesome. It was so <laughs> awesome. As long as it's a square nail, that counts. <laughs> yep. Even a 16-penny nail is awesome. <laughs> Brandon, last words, man, and we'll get out of here. Uh, you know, these last, uh, last words to people out listening to the podcast, which we appreciate. Uh, tell them how they can visit you. I know Tony's been posting your link. You can also find a link to his channel straight down below in the description of this podcast, but we'll give you the last word here, bud. Uh, just keep in mind, if y'all want to find me, Adventure Archaeology on YouTube, Adventure Archaeology and Southern Diggers on Facebook, you can follow me on either. We'd appreciate it. Uh, we are a family-friendly channel. There will never be cussing or anything like that. There's never any drama. My team is not one of the bottle tigger, digger teams that get mad at each other and split up and create different channels. The guys <laughs> that you see from day one are the guys that you will still see. We get along and talk daily. And we are just one of those groups that we keep it as real as possible. We show you the good days. We show you the bad. So if you want to see that, be sure to come and follow us. Uh, other than that, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Ken. We appreciate y'all reaching out and talking with me last year. I had to deny y'all a couple times last year because of how busy my schedule is. And thanks yeah. for fitting me in when you did. I appreciate that so much more than you even realize. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to see you in Colorado this uh, this summer. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it'll be yeah, good. Be cool. Let's, do <laughs> Let's do it. All right, hold on. We're going to say our goodbyes and get out of here. Tony, what do you got? Just want to thank Brandon. Like I said at the beginning of the show, you know, I've been following you for a long time. You're inspiration to everybody. I love your channel. Love your attitude. And, uh, you know, I try and steal as many things as I can from you to try to be successful as you are. So keep up the good work. I truly, honestly... Uh, really do get inspired by you and i i think you're fantastic uh, ambassador for the any treasure hunting community so i i truly appreciate you um uh, overall you can find uh, me at 5280 adventures anywhere on social media just do that search and you'll find me and uh ken what you got yeah. for us adventures in dirt you find me anywhere as well adventures in dirt uh tune in next week we got another great show for you next thursday and then we're going to be taking some time off uh, as we get closer to england we're going to try to pre-record some shows so that you guys have something to listen to maybe we'll uh, get some real special guests in there on that mm. but everyone have yourself a great week if you're able to dig this weekend which we are not <laughs> go, f go find the good stuff and uh let me know all about it and would love to hear about it uh have a great weekend everyone be safe and we will talk to you again next thursday <laughs> Thank you.